Welcome to the Cool Fireman Podcast, a virtual firehouse kitchen table with Matt, Adam, Brian, Doug, and Freddie, where they discuss everything that matters in today's fire service. Now let's get to the show. What's up, y'all? It's Brian from East Coast Kelly's and the Cool Fireman Podcast. You're watching and listening to a special edition of the Cool Fireman Podcast. It's just me today, but I've got a very special guest. And we are at the South Atlantic Fire Rescue Expo in Raleigh, North Carolina. And today with me, I've got Sam from FireTech. Hey. You may have seen his podcast on, which is the 2448. Sam is a very technical guy, and we wanted to bring somebody technical that in the market right now, we're finding out is on the majority of the new trucks that people are buying. But more importantly, Sam is helping the community understand the tools that they're using through this platform on social media. So if you're not following FireTech, go give them a follow. So welcome, Sam. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. So, so super here. exciting. We're at your home show. How cool is that? It's good. This is a uh, year number. We started in 2011. So whatever that is, you're yeah. almost 15. Like that. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I was like, what does it feel like? I mean, you're on, I mean, you're like on the international platform, but you've talked about a couple of times on the 2448 about how this is your home show and it has a little bit of different feel to it for yeah. you. So what, what does that mean to it's you? It's fun. You know, when, when I started the business, we, uh, business is a big word for what we did when I started, but it was really like, I went behind us as the show floor and there's all these pillars. I would get the smallest booth behind this mm-hmm. biggest pillar in the most horrible to find location. And I don't know, uh, it was like back then I felt like it was big times. We're inside yes. the thing yeah. and we'd set our lights out and we'd talk to people. And I don't know why people would talk to me, but I appreciated that they did. Yeah. And it was nice because I knew a lot of the guys. I was a fireman in town. And then, you know, I'd show our wares. Mm-hmm. And people began to trust us. Like, they'd try us with something, and then they'd try us with something bigger. And now it's fun to go from a little booth in the back of the show that no one really wanted to come visit to literally every truck here, maybe save for two or three, to have yeah. something we make or everything we make all the way around them. And it's, it's pretty cool. It is. It's very, very cool. It's got to be also... And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it has to be a little bit of humbling, right? To see where you <laughs> came cool. from, to be able to walk the floor and say, that's on ours, that's on there. But I love your story. And, and for our listeners who didn't watch, which I, I encourage you to go do, go subscribe to the 2448 and listen to episode one, the very <laughs> first one, because you tell your story. And yeah. We don't have time to do all that in sure. today's, but it's pretty cool. It's a two part, if I'm not mistaken, yep, it's broken correct. up into two parts. And it's very, very cool to listen to how you guys became. Yeah. Right? So kind of take folks, if you can, and give them the bookends of how you started and where you're at today Yeah, as a company. Because I think it's so cool. Sure. So we, when I started, I had run a couple businesses before. I ran a stage productions business, did like DJ lighting and sound. And then I ran a biofuels business. I was not a great student. And so I didn't, I didn't enjoy the traditional educational path. Business was my avenue. And I loved those two things. The second business, the biofuel business, didn't go as well as I'd hoped. There was an acquisition that went down. Didn't go exactly as according to Ryan. Learned a lot of lessons. And as I left that business, I began working basically as a professional water skier, more as a coach than anything else. But I uh, was looking for something to do because you can't do that forever and you can't make a living doing it. Right. And so I thought, well, in the biofuel days, we sold light bars. We sold accessories for these kits, for these trucks people were doing. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe I could... um, sell some lighting tech to our you know, similar type of customer. I thought maybe the towing market. So I went to a towing show, brought some lights in from overseas. They were garbage, but I sold them to some guys. And yeah. The problem was they had my name on them. Yeah. And when they did, I'd given these guys a warranty and the warranty wasn't very good because mm-hmm. the stuff was going from some overseas company right. and it wasn't any good. Right. So long story short, the, um, at, the, at a tow show, I had a warranty product. I found a U.S. manufacturer that was a proper manufacturer and uh, warranty this stuff out for these customers that had trusted me early. And I was at a tow show trying to figure out if I can create a new audience to sell this stuff to. And um, someone at the tow show sold light towers. And the light tower guy was like, oh, this is not our primary market. We sell them to the firefighters. The firefighters are, that's where the revenue is. Right. I'm like, I, I don't really know that, I don't know anything about being a fireman. I'll go right. try to sell those guys. And the very short version of the story is I tried to sell the firemen. I wasn't a fireman. They didn't trust me. So this fire chief invited me to go join the volunteer fire station. He was like, I can't teach you about lighting your business, but I can teach you about... Uh, being a firefighter, once you understand the role, maybe you will you'll do better as a business person. So we, uh, do you think it did? If I can ask that question, yeah. What was your takeaway from that? Do um, you still volunteer today? A little, I bit. do, hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. I, I really, I'd always thought it was an interesting profession. Right. And where I came from in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax, 
it's a very structured, prestigious, high-end yeah. fire department that's very difficult to get into. And there's not really an opportunity to volunteer. And the opportunity that does exist is like, you're going to come in and do 400 years of school before you're ever allowed to even look at a fire truck. Right. I was like, I hate school. I'm never doing that. You'll never see anything but the bathroom. Yeah, I was right. like, I'm not going to do that. Right. So in this little town in Lillington, the, the fire guys were like, I mean, like, it's just us. So when the fire alarm goes off, we need help. If you need yeah. to carry pike poles to the firemen, that's helping us. And yeah. so you got to get on the truck and come out there. We'll teach you how not to get killed. Right. And then you can learn the, the profession and you get yeah. closer and closer and closer to being a firefighter until eventually you can become a firefighter. Right. So I was like, all right, well, that's day one. Uh, I've begun doing the profession and then watching people work and seeing people work after dark and then working after dark and then going through the training to understand why after dark. I realized that there was a very specific need because it's impossible to do the job after dark if you can't see. Right. And the best tools in the world don't matter if you can't see the subject of the incident. And so the the experience I gained, I mean, like I wasn't a New York City fireman, I was a little town. Right. But as a little town volunteer fireman, taught me enough to know what sort of tech was relevant and why, because why matters more than what. Sure. And um, Well, that also builds trust. Oh, my God. Right? Well, it's like people, the one thing about firemen is they can, they can smell a con artist a mile away. Yes. And the most trusted person in a community typically is a firefighter and the least trusted person in the community is a salesperson. Yes. And so if you're going to bridge that gap, you have to understand both ends and you have to realize that as a salesperson talking to the most trusted person in the community, you almost have this ethical obligation to do well by that customer because yes, while they're spending money with you mm-hmm. and there's just the business exchange, change, national business exchange, the public is entrusting them to make good decisions and they are then entrusting you to help them make good decisions. And so if you have any morals at all, you should take that responsibility with some high degree of esteem or regard and do a good job because it's the right thing to do. And so I learned a lot about that whole relationship and, um, and you know, going from just importing cheap lights that failed to designing and manufacturing our own product. And some of it's made here and some of it's made overseas, but it's our designs, it's our tooling, it's our engineering IP. Now we can help firefighters all over the country do really good work and it makes big impact. And, Having that experience is really what I think is um, has been instrumental in the success you see here at the show. These guys I've worked with, I've fought fire with, I've cried with when we've had there was a fireman at the place we hear on the episode that um, one of my early mentors died. It was a line of duty death. It was a cardiac arrest. My first medical call ever had a lighting related impact when the ambulance couldn't find the house. It it wouldn't have actually helped in that particular situation um, if the ambulance would have got there faster. We had everything we needed. But as I thought about it afterwards, and for 15 years now I've thought about it, what if lighting hadn't been a problem and what if they could have got their two seconds faster or what if we would have had yeah. more resources and i never want other firefighters to think about the tech and then wonder could that tech have been a difference between life and death for a you know it's not necessarily a friend every every situation but it could just be for a member of the public and so if i'm thinking back about calls that have gone bad i never want to worry about the tech and so the portion mm-hmm. of the business that i can play in that can help people not worry about their tech as long as they can see to do the job then they gave at least that much baseline fundamental you covered that for them. It's like, all right, boom. Now check that off. You don't have to worry about the tech. Right. Now it's what else went wrong. Yeah. So, so I want to, I want to go back and dissect yeah. just one or two things because you, you know, we were talking about the pace of it earlier. And I think, I think you, you, you went over that pretty quick, but I think it's important for people to understand that, you know, a lot of companies now come up with an idea and they give it to someone else to do, but you guys are designing it. Yep. You're manufacturing it. Yeah. And more importantly, you're standing behind it. Yeah, like, sometimes right. on top of it, too. And on top of it. <laughs> or lifting a Hummer with a yeah, crane. Exactly. We talked about that yesterday. Yeah. But how cool is all of that? So, you know, there's there's the the ownership that you have on the floor, not only here in North Carolina, but as you travel around the world now mm. for your company, right? Yeah. Like this is worldwide. So so from the from the humble beginnings of a guy behind a corner just wanting to be <laughs> just wanting to be trusted. Yeah. To the guy that's now trusted around the world, and I'm not trying to maybe blow your head up or give you any sense of guilt, but just the reality of it, right? Yeah. What is fire tech today? Mm. And if I could ask, I'm not asking you for your business model, but what's your what do you see yourself in five to ten years as the owner yeah. of fire tech? You don't fit the mold of a CEO, right? And that's okay. <laughs> that's, that's, good. that's good because you know why that also brings trust. Yeah. When you walk into a firehouse. It's I'm not wearing a suit and tie. Let me tell you, when I go to a firehouse, yes. I'm wearing something the firemen wear, and we're just going to chat and BS having yes. a good time because that's what that's what works. I yeah, mean, that's what builds trust. Yeah, I, I think you you said it so eloquently that your know, firefighters are not going to buy your product if they can't trust you. Yeah, and they shouldn't. Right? And they shouldn't. They, they shouldn't. Should not. There should be because the community trusts them to make good decisions. 
And so they must have enough trust in the suppliers that they're spending yeah. community members' funds on yes. in order to have a symbiotic relationship. Otherwise, they're not being fiduciarily responsible. When you walk around this uh, hall here today, especially for North, the North Carolina show, and I've been to some national shows, the vibe is a little bit different. But here, there's a lot of small business, firefighter-owned, the 2448, oh, yeah. and they take the trust factor oh. and the why totally different than yeah. here. So for our listeners that may not have ever come to the show, you need to come to the show, plan it, it's worth the trip, walk the hall, the exhibit floor, I don't even know how many hundred thousand square foot this is, maybe 100, 150, I don't know, but it's huge. And you get to meet a lot of the small businesses of people who literally take it like I don't want to say serious because serious is not even the right word. It's it's yeah. underplayed. Yeah. They truly own it. They worry about it at night to say, my brothers and sisters who are going into fight fire are relying on me. Yeah. And, and you took that and you explained that. So, so again, not to, not to drag that on, but what do you think, what is your vision casting for five to 10? Where are you at now? And where do yeah. you see yourself in five to 10? We recently company? launched. So when we started, I started with work lights because, because I understood white lighting. I had this background in stage lighting. I understood a little bit about environmental lighting creation and not like environmental like green stuff but like how do i help create an environment of safety for first responders so we started in scene lights we actually started with headlights and brow lights the brow lights the first one because when you think about the photos that line the walls in the fire apparatus manufacturers conference rooms are the photos of the front of fire trucks Mm -hmm. so i didn't want to start going tail lights because i wanted to be on the walls so we were in front of mine for all of our customers how like molecular but how (laughs) it was extremely important because it was one guy was just me so if i had to capture i did not have a marketing team i did not have any money it was like yeah. I got to be really efficient. So I want to get my genius. picture on that wall. That's genius. So we started with the brow light, then we did the headlights, and then we did the rest of the package. Right. And so as a scene light specialist to start, last year we launched uh, a whole new product portfolio that's flashing lighting. And what you think about in lighting is that in order to do scene lights, it's an electrical and a thermal problem. It's how, how do you make the LEDs and the, and the components on the board uh, be bright and efficient? But then thermally, how do you keep them from overheating? And that's really what scene lighting is all about. But when you think about flashing lights, it's it's actually a totally different technology. Flashing lights are rates, it's colors, it's intensities, it's durations, there's flash energy, and it's all computer software controlled. And so electrically, it's a very different product. Engineering-wise and mechanically, it's a very different product. And while they look the same, under the hood, they're very different. And so we had to develop that discipline. Long story short, we launched some products for that um, portfolio just this last year called the FireTech Omen Light Bar and then our mm-hmm. Hyvis Connect lighting system. And that was really like a total reinvention of the business from a traditional electronics manufacturer that focused on scene lights to a software and tech enabled intelligent transportation sector of technologies that help connect first responders to the world around them. And that's where we're going. We're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into tech. And when you think about flashing lights, you know, first it was scene lights, then it was flashing lights. Now it's what happens when the driver is a non-human operator of a vehicle? And like you don't need a boat if there's no ocean to sail in. And every auto manufacturer in the world is saying, hey, we're going after market share where there's a non-human operator, where there's a semi-autonomous or autonomous vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it's not a five-year play, but that's like the longer-term roadmap. And so digital alerting, communication, Bluetooth, cellular, wireless, DSRC even, even though it got killed. But imagine that those are the the communication protocols that are are important. Digital alerting is just equally as important as visual alerting or audible alerting because the tech is evolving and we're getting into an environment where we're operating on the roadway with smarter vehicles and with smarter infrastructure. So to answer your question, maybe a little bit more directly, we went from scene lights into flashing lights, but flashing lights is a bridge into tech. And the tech is all designed to connect the first responder to the world around them so that they can be more efficient and more effective, not just after dark, but while working with the community to make them safer. So I, I, I love that. Um, and I loved uh, recently I was watching um, one of your shorts uh, online for social media. And, and, you know, sometimes it's very technical and I get lost, but I, I value the explanation. I, I've, I've commented a couple of times. <laughs> I love it. You, 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 you told me, I was like, I don't understand any of that. But what I do love is the transparency, hmm. right? Like I'll sit there and watch the whole thing. I'm your guy helping your algorithm. Up. I, I love that. But, but, Thank but, you for that. <laughs> but I'm doing that because not because I have an obligation to learn it, but to, but to learn it, well, to semi learn it, but also to understand that this company cares enough to, to tell me the why, to tell me the backstory of it. So, you know, when you think technology and everything, there's a lot of folks, a lot of firefighters and a lot of different folks who are worried about technology crashing and yeah. stuff. And, and it's not just y'all who are investing in that. But I would ask maybe the follow-up question is that of how, how can you vision cast 
in that and say it could crash. It could. I mean, but is it? Is it? I mean, it's it's a thought, but it's not a worry. I guess um, it's more likely you're going to forget to fill the truck up, and okay. you're going to run out of fuel, or you're going to forget to plug it in, and it's okay. not going to start. And I can't say that based on a specific study that we've run side by side. But if you look at general human behavior and you look at the aptitude of a modern firefighter, like our firefighters, they're getting younger and younger, or at least their birth yeah. dates are getting new, yeah. more closer and closer. So folks are born with, with technology around them. They're more comfortable in it. And the things that are less common, firefighters can't press a stick. They don't know how to run a lawnmower. It's like those basic skills that like yeah. when, even like when I started in the fire service 15 years ago, or you know, 30, 40 years ago, like there were very different skill sets and disciplines in our audience. And so when you think about the likelihood that a modern firefighter might forget something more basic, like to plug something in or to fuel the vehicle, seems in my experience like it's higher than it might have been in the past because many of our firefighting personnel today don't drive vehicles even have fuel in them. And so like we think about like, well, what happens if tech crashes? Well, I mean, what happens if the vehicle crashes? What happens if you forget your yeah. your thing or you leave your gear at the station or right. like things happen? Fire trucks, lights working is not the big thing because tech won't work. Electricity won't work. Cards won't work. That kind overall, of overall, and the thing is, like, so the I think there's a really interesting correlation between fire service training about how to bring incidents under control effectively and business. There are so many correlations in the two, and the primary one that I teach my team all the time is plan backup, backup to the backup. And as soon as you roll from your plan so to your backup, get slower so that way they can hear. That was genius. Yeah, it's in the fire service in my firefighter ops and awareness class. I remember that the instructor got up and was like. Everything in the fire service has a plan, primary plan, mm-hmm. a backup plan, and then a backup to the backup. Yes. And in business, I mean, I'm like ruthless about everybody should have a plan, a backup, and a backup to the backup yes. for everything. So like yes. if you're bringing a camera, you better have your backup. Back. If you're doing an interview, what's your backup and your backup to the backup? Yes. And so when I think about tech, if you evaluate tech from the perspective of is the person designing the tech thinking through the backup and the backup to the backup? Mm. Or is the person designing tech not designing tech specifically for our market? If you think about designing tech for the consumer market, it may not be as critical that it has so many backup plans on board. But with my training and experience as a first responder, I recognize the importance of plan, backup, and backup to the backup. And the transition from, if I'm going from plan to backup, now I need to be creating a new backup to the backup because now I've only got one layer. You always have to have two redundants. And so when you think about like the type of stuff we're doing, you know, it's it communicates over hard wires. Well, if the hard wires get cut, then what happens? Well, it communicates wirelessly. Okay, well, if the wireless stops working, what happens? Well, if it doesn't have communication and it knows it doesn't have communication, it then does its own thing internally based on its own flash pattern. Well, yeah, but then what happens? Well, if you get water inside of it, then we have the world's first advanced exchange lifetime warranty. But before that even occurs, we have an EVT on staff that can handle all the things you might need in order to figure out what's wrong with it to keep your truck in service. So from a business model and a tech standpoint, you can engineer robust, reliable tech the Apollo space shuttle was not a techless product. Yeah. It was the most advanced, sophisticated tech of the 60s, and they landed someone on the moon. Yeah. And so tech's not a bad thing. You just have to make sure that you're engineering it properly for the environment that you're going to use it in. You know, you said something there pretty quickly, and I want to go back to that, and then and then, and then we'll move on to the 24-4 sure. Was I thought it was so cool because when you said lifetime warranty, so I had spec the truck, uh, one of the first ones in North Carolina that had it, uh, the fire check brand, a mutual friend of ours, Trey. Oh yeah. And so <laughs> that's right. We forgot. Yeah. yeah, Trey. So we put it on our truck and it was headlights and he told me lifetime warranty. I'll never forget. I was at the plant for pre-construction on this truck and I was like, nobody gives a lifetime warranty. And my immediate thought then, and every time I hear fire tech, uh, lifetime warranty, I go back to Tommy boy where he mm. talks about the warranty on the box. Yeah. But you know what I think is different? And it come, kind of comes back to that is because of the explanation you just gave about how well you think it through, the need for that warranty. Our failure rate is like a tenth of a percent on most products. Yeah, see, the likelihood of a failure, if you design the product properly, the likelihood can be zero. And some people, actually really funny. So if you look around the lighting manufacturers in the space, all of the lighting manufacturers have copied our warranty and applied it to tech that wasn't designed to last as long as ours was. So now they've taken tech that was originally warranted for five years. It was designed for maybe a five or six year service life. And because we've pushed the industry into the expectation of a lifetime warranty, all of these other manufacturers are now saying, oh, we offer a lifetime warranty too. But nothing changed at a, at a circuit board level, at a thermal management level, at an optimal level. Like nothing changed to make that product inherently more reliable. Yeah. And we can build a product that has a one second warranty, but the likelihood you're going to need to replace it is almost zero. Right. Not impossible, but there's a plan, a backup, and a backup of the backup built into every component on the product. I just think that's so cool. It's, that's I, fire I, service I built in. I think you know? it's so cool though, because again, 
I go back to the Tommy boy is the warranties is good, only as good as the information on the package. They used to tell me that here. Oh, they're like, oh, what, a lifetime warranty? Who's lifetime? Oh, what happens if you're out of business? Right. I'm like, listen, man, we've designed this thing so well that even if we are out of business, you're never going to have to touch it again. And they're like, what do you mean? And then they would, I remember early on the fire guys, because they'll, they'll call you on anything. They, will they call can you smell a anything. BS artist a mile away. So one time I was doing this demo and I'm like, these lights, you know, temperature is number one killer of LEDs and moisture is number two. So I explained how we don't get moisture inside. And I said, temperature is really what you need to be. All the light manufacturers are competing on thermal management. This thing, based on the temperature outside, if you plugged it in and let it run an hour, it wouldn't get above maybe 80 degrees or so. The guy's like, really? I said, yeah, 100%. This is before I was really a fireman. I was like, yeah, that's the story. This is when halogen tech was 500 degrees and you would splash water on it and would jetter. So I was like, all right, well, why don't you set it up? So I set it up. He pulls out his thermal imaging camera and he sets it on the ground. And he goes, in one hour, I'm going to come outside and see if you're bullshitting me. And if I, if I was wrong, he would have never bought what we had to sell. Wow. And so we went inside, had a cup of coffee, came back out, he's shining on the light. It's all right, I can trust you. And all it's right. like, trust but verify. And I, I knew that minute, I was like, okay, the fire service is a very different animal. Yeah. And I better make sure that I know every detail because details matter. And the plan, the backup, and the backup, the backup have to be ingrained in the tech because not only do we have to be trustworthy, we also have to be willing to put our money where our mouth is. And our audience has the capacity and the intellect to prove and test what we've said. And so- wow. It's a really exposing market, but it's a great market. Yeah. So, so as we move to the 2448 podcast, I want to ask, would that be kind of your advice to somebody who's thinking of being the startup business, of being the guy that's behind the pillar that you're here, but you're not really seeing? Is that kind of your thought? As, as, um, you, as you look back at your brand back then, would you think that that's important? I mean, I think that as firefighters are probably going to already have that sense of planning that way, the trust, but... It depends on what you're selling. I think evaluate. Okay. So you got to start with the application and evaluate backwards. How important is it the light doesn't turn off? Well, if I'm working outside with a set of cutters in my hand and it depends on whether or not I can see the patient, otherwise the operation stops, well, then it, you have to engineer the most ridiculous sets of backup plans into right. it. But if you're developing, like, you know, I don't know, like Taylor, my buddy from Taylor's Taylor. Are you not Taylor? Right. Yeah, so yeah. like if you're developing a coffee cup, like what's the worst that happens? Okay, you don't want to get burned. You don't want to spill it. The worst, like, the worst that happens is it's a different type of environment. It's not to say sure. one's better or different than the other. But you and only, the expectation is different. You right? have if to you, evaluate the customer portfolio. If you drop his mega gold. Giant. Give him one today. He doubles yeah. the drum. And, and so if it if it dints or dings, there was not, it wasn't saving a life. And that's the right? best customer service in the world. So Taylor can quickly say, oh, I got you. Don't worry about it. Boom, here's a new one. And it's, but it's no big deal if it breaks because right. it's like the impact of a break is nothing. And that's some of the best customer service you'll see in the industry. Right. But you can offset sometimes with reliable, reliability and integrity of product matter more. Sometimes having a great brand and user experience matters more. But it depends on, is this tool used for a life safety application, mission vehicle application, or isn't it? Because if sure. it's like a t-shirt, if I get a hole in a t-shirt, I just get a new right. t-shirt. I'm not going to cry right. about it. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, the t-shirt yeah. company takes care of me? Yeah. So, I mean, so yeah. think it through, I, I think is what I'm Yeah, thinking. I would say don't don't get, because, you know, people get analysis paralysis so fast. And, True. I love that. Analysis oh, paralysis. my God. And there's just like, I, I can't execute because I do, how do I get all the ducks in a row? I got to have my financing. I got to have my product. I got to have my testing. My long test plan. I don't know if you know this. When we, when we launched the Omen, our guys were like just going on and on and on and on. And on. Like this last couple of like, what about the coding? What about this? What about that? I'm like, let's, can we please do an evaluation of what it's going to take to bring this thing to market on time? Like, well, you know, we want to do this thing and this thing. I'm like, the whole product is infinitely updatable firmware. So please focus on the hardware so when we get the hardware to market, you never have yeah. to make a change optically, mechanically, or electrically. Everything else we get updated in software because it's yeah, you can push it takes your five out. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I guess that makes sense. The whole purpose of this thing is it's updatable. I'm like, okay, so focus on the part that matters now. Focus on what you can't update right. later. Right. So like people, right. Right. you get analysis paralysis when you have that even perfect. My advice to a firefighter that wants to start a business, go start it. And if it's not a super high risk thing, then what, what just go. Lost? Yeah, what are you going to lose? Just keep your fireman job until you know that it's right. off the ground. Right. Right. I started in high base. I was working part-time on an ambulance. I was paying my rent selling lawnmowers. So I would buy a lawnmower and flip it. Cut my grass and flip it on Craigslist and make 150 bucks. Oh, nice. I did three a month and I paid my rent. The fire service paid anything I made in the fire service at 10 bucks an hour was what I used to start the business. And I kept that job until the business was making more than the fire service that was more stable. So then I stopped doing the part-time work and, and really lean full into the, mm. into the That is a perfect segue into the 2448. So what, kind of give folks what, what it is. I was, yep. I was honored to be a guest on this, yeah. on this season and kind of talk about it. And um, I've mentioned a couple of times on our podcast, kind of the purpose, but I'd love to hear it from your perspective. Yeah. 
why did you decide to start it and why do you continue to do it? Yeah. Why? I, why? why I, uh, that? And the craziness that is, Sam, <laughs> you know, with FireTech, why do you continue to do it? I think that it's really interesting. Capitalism gets a bad rap. Mm. And I think that it's amazing. You can use business as a tool to do good in the world. Mm. And so often people say, oh, you're just some, you know, red blooded capitalist. Just like, hold on a minute. We exist to help first responders save lives, period. So, if we can use business to do that, that's a great thing. And so then I really want to encourage others who have similar worldview or similar view around the business world. Like maybe I could use business and it doesn't have to be selling things in the fire service. You can be making sandwiches. You can be doing sure. whatever. I mean, hanging Christmas lights. I don't care what you're doing in business, right. but you could, people that can use business to do good in the world, I think should be celebrated. And entrepreneurialism is this like magic key to write your own path. And I love that about it. And so I wanted to encourage others. The fire service is the perfect pairing for an entrepreneurial discipline because you have educational background of a firefighter. And I'm not talking about like, like school, university, but like in order to become a firefighter, you have to be good at hydraulics, electronics, mechanics. You got to be able to run saws and tools, driving. You got to be most of the time medical. You got to be legal. Like you have all these skill sets and disciplines where you're very well-rounded as a person. And then what is it, 11 days a month, most places where you're working full time and you have all this free time so you get great benefits, you get great rewarding community, you get great education, you have a set of skills that are useful and applicable, and then you also have time. And time is the biggest thing. So people say fire service doesn't pay me enough. The fire service pays you plenty in right. stability. Yeah. Now that you've got that stability and time, nobody can give you time except the fire service. I, I talk to young kids all the time, whether it be an explorer program or whatever, and I tell them that. They're like, yeah, I'm thinking about being a welder. I'm thinking about doing this. I'm thinking about doing that. And I said, I really wish if you would consider emergency services, the fire service specifically, because it's going to give you the stability, yet the freedom, right? Then like, you go start your business. Yeah, and it's you like, start if it. it doesn't go well, you've still got full time pay and benefits. Yes. If it does go well, then great, you can transition out. When when I started, the majority of the folks back home where I work at, they had the trade as the side job and it brought in cash for them. Yeah. Cutting grass, electricians, yep. you know, carpentry guys, trim finishers, whatever. And and, and I'm sure across the country, it's still that way now. It's a little bit different as folks get, you know, younger ones come in as the volunteer fire service change. They're yeah. doing more part-time work yeah. in the fire service, which I think it's a whole, we've talked about it on our podcast, burnout uh, is really, going yeah. to hit hard. But for folks like your guests on the 2448, they're really tapping into that other service, right? Yeah, yeah and the 2448, I didn't actually finish it. That's okay. Yeah, tell them the, uh, the 2448 is... Um, the show celebrates entrepreneurialism of first responders who start businesses, and it celebrates what they do in the 48 off. The 24, 48 shift schedule mm -hmm. is one that exists around the country. So 24 hours on, and in 48 off, what are you doing with your time is the question that I ask folks. Yeah. And so it's celebrating entrepreneurial first responders and their plight around business. Yeah. And so that's, that's the type of guests that we bring in. And that's why this whole conversation yeah. really exists. It exists. And so with that, with that episode, you have a, I don't want to say a stock set of questions, but as a, as, as a <laughs> listener, there are some that says, tell me your story, right? Yeah. And then, you know, do you work on it while you're on shift or things like that? So one of my questions is, have you, do you have a guest that over time maybe gave you a surprise of an answer or something that I don't want to, I don't want to put you on the spot. Huh. Like, do you have one of those things that like, as you came into this with that mission in mind of one were those where you were like, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that answer. I wasn't expecting that why, if you will, of service. I wasn't expecting. There's a gentleman you know, from season two and James Wessel from Brindley Mountain Fire Apparatus, and they're used fire truck dealer. And James is a fascinating individual, super intelligent. And he, he sells used fire trucks, which is like you think about you buy a truck, you sell a truck. He's been a fireman in very small town, Alabama. But his expertise grew from this relentless pursuit of financial knowledge. He had to understand how banks and lending and structured capital worked mm -hmm. in order to then build this business that could trade assets that are two hundred thousand to million dollar assets, bringing them in, financing them, moving them back out, working on them, handling the transaction sale, and how lease models work, and created this business that supports uh, the community. But through this, like, it, it's all like this financial aptitude that you just don't get normally in the public safety world. Mm -hmm. And he was very interesting in the way he articulated those financial disciplines and his journey through working with a bank who told him no. And then what did he have to do to overcome that? And then how did he have to understand the models in order to make it work? Because he still wanted to make this business happen. Right. I think that 
what you don't realize or what you know, it maybe has been interesting and maybe whether it's James's story or it's any of yours or the others that have been a part of the, the uh, podcast is that people bring skill sets that like they almost sometimes forget to market as their skill set. Mm. It's like, oh, well, yeah, but I've got and that's why I do this business. And it's like, I don't know, people spend a lifetime trying to learn that skill. Like, well, yeah, but I had to learn it because in the fire service, I had this thing and mm. I want to get a promotion. So I had to take this course. Public speaking is one that's come up. And it's like people spend time learning public speaking. But it's so, okay. Well, I was getting ready for promotion. I wanted to go to officer school or I wanted to whatever. And that was something that was required. And so therefore, it's like, okay, well, now in business, you use that every day. And yeah. so I have found that it's probably more broadly, I find the skills that people have brought from public safety into the fire service some, or into the business world sometimes are um, skills that you take for granted in public safety, ah. but that are really unique in- And critical. Yeah, in business. Because like plan backup and backup and backup, every firefighter anywhere in the country has been taught that in the academy. Early is on time, on time's late, late's not acceptable. Every firefighter has been yes. taught that. I'm sure you can think of a thousand stories of like, oh, well, you know. Yeah. And so like we think about the uh, absolute emphasis on integrity, the way you write a report, when you know it's a written report, you know it's a legal document, every firefighter knows the, the importance mm-hmm. of getting a legal document right. Yeah. And business people have to have those skills. Without the experiences, it's very difficult to gain them. Yeah. And so all of our guests as a collective group have skills that they sometimes forget how to articulate or even don't think to articulate because they just have them as innate experiences as right. first responders, but they're actually directly translated. They're almost business. like, uh, I don't want to say repetitive, but they're so they're done so systematically and so repetitively there yeah. that they're just come as second nature in their yeah. business. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think like our, our, our guests have a broad diversity from um, some very, very small business where whether it's making radio straps or widgets or something tangible to very, very large you know, multinational organizations with thousands of employees. When you look at the differences in types of business, business is still business. Right. And like one plus one has to equal three or else it's not worth doing. And so I find that as people grow their business or in their different stages, the questions I ask really... Um, I pull from the experience that I had going from public safety to business. And I really want to know candidly, like, did these other people have to do the same thing I did? Because it felt weird when I did it. Like oh, answering wow. phone calls in the bays between calls. Yeah. Our chief used to let me sit out in the bays. He's like, listen, station duties first. Once station duties are done, I don't care what you do in the bays. But when that alarm goes off, you better be on the truck. You right. probably better be the first guy on the truck because I know you're out there working. Yes. But like that, ex- and I'm like, okay, well, so when I ask, yes, like, what do your chief think? It's because I remember thinking like, that's, I can't believe they let me do this. Right. And then, but it's right at the time piece. Yeah. It's like, yes. It's it the greatest thing ever. Yes. So there are. It's, it's funny this, that kind of my interest in, like, I want to know why people wanted to be first responders because that's an interesting story in and of itself. Nobody, like, just just falls into it. It's like, oh, I had a parent. I had a major right. accident. I had a major, whatever. And so I want to know about their public safety career. I want to know about why they wanted to do it. I want to know about what struck them about business and what the experience was like in the transition. And that's what I'm trying to pick out when I'm interviewing. So last question, and then we'll yeah. wrap this up. Um, we could probably sit here and talk for hours. But <laughs> what, you know, I asked you about where you see fire tech. Yeah. Um, where do you see the 2448? I mean, you're, you're stretched pretty thin. I mean, yeah. before the show, you were traveling internationally and you travel, travel internationally a lot. And as, as your commitments grow, do you see 2448? And I, again, I hate to put you on the spot, but like, do you see it being something that you can maintain or 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 is that something that may have to go back? I mean, what what is it? I mean, is it the thing that you just kind of like enjoy doing? I don't know. I'll let you answer the question. It's funny. Season two uh, took me a year to get a half, to get half the number of episodes that season one took. So my time is getting more and more compressed and the ability to create high quality content is getting more and more difficult. I really love it because I really think that first responders should be celebrated in their pursuit of business. Yeah. So it's the perfect marrying of two different professions that I think fit like a handshake. Yeah. So from a personal level, I desire to continue operating and building the 2448 as a show from a professional level. I don't know that I will have the time to do it as well as I want to do it. Right. But I don't know that that needs to mean that the show can't continue to live on. Yeah. It might just be that the rate at which we can execute becomes maybe a little bit less or that I have to lean on other professionals in our business to hop in and join. And as I'm building our team, other entrepreneurial business minded people that have spent time as first responders yeah. have the same validity on the stage that I do. I'm hoping to be able to cultivate their experience and their skill sets so that they can then help to bring the stories of others out as well. To do it. Yeah. And that's the value that you find in it, right? Yeah. I think it's, I mean, ultimately, the value is can I encourage a first responder listener 
to consider business as an opportunity instead of just get scared of it and run away. Because business by nature is not typically super secure. Firefighting is pretty secure. Government job, pension, like clear shift schedule. Business, I don't know when my next meal is coming. Right. So I really want to encourage first responders yeah. to do both because it can be so rewarding, but it just takes someone telling them or helping them like, here are enough stories. You can hear others have done it. Yeah. You can do it. Just go ahead and give it a try. I think that's so cool. So thank you for coming on the show yeah. today. I think it was so fantastic. Again, I could, I could, we could do this for, for a long time. We've got the bagpipes in the background. I don't know if you hear it. It's such a really cool experience. Hopefully you will be able to come to Safer, experience it. Come visit Sam. He'll be here every year, uh, you know, living this up, right? Like with, 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 with <laughs> us. Um, be sure to listen to their podcast, the 2448, on all platforms. Uh, go back and listen to season one. Start them over. That's a, it's, a, it's a really cool thing to listen to theirs as well, but also to subscribe to all their platforms of social media because you're going to learn about the products. That are going to be on your rides. What is it? The the market share right now you guys are on what? Uh, we're, this number yesterday. we're probably on thirty five percent of the fire trucks at a at a ma- macro level, like a big lots of the lights, and we're probably on eighty percent of the fire truck with some product we make. Isn't that crazy? That's pretty cool. So eighty percent of y'all on new trucks have their product on it. So it's very cool to uh, be involved with somebody who's giving back so much. So thanks for watching, y'all, and we'll do the uh, the closing credits and all the info that we normally do on our show. Next, right after this. Roll it, Gigi! Before you leave, hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications, and give these firemen a huge thumbs up. Also, make sure you check out the coolfireman.com for more. Thanks!